So for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm uh, Dr. Stephen Pipe. I'm a, a pediatric hematologist at the uh, University of Michigan. And as you can imagine, we've been at the forefront of the coronavirus response um, uh, for several weeks, but uh, even uh, more pressing uh, since this past Wednesday. So this is what uh, my Wednesday looked like. Um, and this is, a, this is a little bit uh, funny as well, because as you may have heard, uh, Tom Hanks and his wife are hunkered down in Australia, uh, affected by the, uh, the COVID-19. Um, but uh, from the first uh, hour of my day on Wednesday morning, um, all of this began to unfold in a real way uh, in my hospital. So we want to try to bring order here and uh, get rid of the panic. And uh, I want to be able to walk you through some important information. So a lot of terms have been thrown around. Uh, the official term uh, that you may have heard, COVID-19, really just simply means coronavirus disease uh, 2019, since that's when it starts. The virus actually has a, a different name. It's uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so what is this? Well, we're all familiar with the seasonal flu, and we've been dealing with this decades and decades. Um, this is not a flu virus, um, and so that's why some of these comparisons to the flu really uh, do fall short. All uh, flu epidemics, which we have every single season, are caused by influenza viruses. Um, we see all different uh, subtle variants of these influenza viruses on a uh, yearly basis, and the vaccines have to really be adapted um, to best target the prediction on which variant's going to come through and, and sweep the world. Uh, there are coronaviruses that um, do affect uh, humans. Um, these do cause uh, uh, cold-like symptoms. But uh, this particular coronavirus has never, uh, to anyone's knowledge, uh, been in humans before. And that's actually where the challenge starts. People have said, why, aren't, why don't we do these things for regular seasonal flu? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, um, we all have at least some degree of immunity to influenza because uh, we go through this every year. And secondly, we also have mass immunization campaigns on a global scale um, that are uh, helpful in reducing uh, the seriousness of infections as well. But this particular coronavirus has no prior uh, uh, example in humans, and so we don't have any immunity to this virus. So what are the symptoms? Uh, pretty much universally, um, fever really persistent, uh, irritating uh, cough, uh, initially a dry cough at the beginning, and then in some cases shortness of breath, and then um, can progress to pretty profound uh, sputum production. People are uh, reporting severe fatigue, muscle aches, etc. Many of these things that you would associate with the seasonal flu. Uh, the good things uh, that we're learning to date, uh, even in the U.S. cases, is that for 80 to 85 percent of the people, this is just going through what you're all used to as a seasonal flu. This does not require most people to even contact their uh, physicians. Um, there is no particular uh, treatment that you can receive for uh, mild symptoms. And the recommendation is that even if you had symptoms that sort of meet what we just talked about, um, you can hunker down at home, reduce your contacts, Definitely stay away from work and stay out of the public forum. And uh, most people uh, will be over this um, in uh, less than a week. And it looks like even the infection duration probably doesn't extend beyond about 14 days. Well, what about the other 15% of people who actually are sick with this? These are the individuals who are showing up at the health systems. Of those 15%, about a third of them are going to need um, intensive care um, to get them through their illness. And we don't, don't really know exactly what the overall mortality is, but I think the consensus now is, is that for those individuals who are at risk, um, this may be about 10 times uh, more serious than uh, the regular seasonal flu. What steps can we take to reduce the risk of infection for ourselves and for others? Uh, well, we're going to show you some examples about this, but you've all by now heard this term of social distancing. This is just practical. This is what we uh, do at the hospital every day. We tell people who are sick to stay home until they're over their symptoms. 
uh, washing hands has always been a priority in the healthcare setting, and we want to advance that uh, in your regular uh, interactions at home as well. Who is at risk for serious illness? In contrast to seasonal flu, um, we've been dealing with a horrendous seasonal flu year that really started last November. Um, so we've already been through four going on five months of uh, one of the worst seasons uh, for seasonal flu that we've had in some time. It's actually gone in several waves. Um, it was actually influenza B in November and December, and then that flipped to the uh, more common uh, influenza A variant, uh, which we are dealing with uh, over these last couple of months. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, older individuals uh, uh, seem to be hit hard with a seasonal flu, but also people who have other health conditions, uh, both respiratory and cardiac conditions. And what's also been really difficult with seasonal flu this year is this has been particularly hard for children. We've had more very, very sick uh, children with seasonal flu, uh, including um, uh, the most um, uh, deaths from uh, seasonal flu in anybody's uh, recent memory. So what's happened is our health system has been very stretched for four months dealing with seasonal flu. And this is what really brings us to the potential for a real breaking point here. We really don't want to have to handle another onslaught of yet, yet another infectious disease on top of what we've been dealing with, the seasonal flu. The people who are uh, really going to need uh, intensive care look like these are individuals who are over 60, those who have underlying respiratory disease, um, so think uh, you know, chronic lung conditions, those who have uh, significant cardiac, cardiovascular uh, disorders, as well as um, individuals who have some other systemic conditions like diabetes. And we also have to be sensitive that there are people who have to take immunosuppressive agents for different disorders. They are also going to be particularly susceptible to this condition. So our health systems have to be freed up to be able to manage these waves of individuals who really do need the care that we can provide at the University of Hospital. So we already heard about social distancing. The next term uh, you, that we're going to be advancing here is why has the current state recommendations been implemented? And you've probably heard this term flatten the curve. So I want to walk you through some principles here. Um, this dotted line here is showing the healthcare system capacity meaning this is what we can safely take care of all at once. And what you can see is if we take a lackadaisical approach like the guy at the bottom who says, whatever, it's just a cold or a flu. Well, if that's the approach we take, we're going to have this influx of people, including that 15% of people who are going to show up at the hospital, and then a third of those who need intensive care. How are we going to take care of them when we're already at capacity with the infections we're dealing with already? So the idea of flatten the curve is to push the infection rate down um, so that the, the patients are distributed over a broader period of time. So the washing hands, not touching your face, um, uh, staying home when you're sick, um, this is not a, a panic process, this is just being careful. I want to show you a tale of two countries. On the left is we have what's happened in Italy, and then uh, uh, in the yellow we have what we've seen happen in South Korea. I was on a teleconference with my colleagues on Tuesday, um, several of whom are from Milan, which is uh, in northern Italy, uh, which has really been the epicenter of the challenges in Italy. And they said it was like a bomb went off in their city. They had taken a, a very lackadaisical approach. The predominant attitude in Italy was, oh, this is just flu. We go through this every year. We don't need to do anything different. And what happened was all of these people got sick. And Italy, unfortunately, has one of the oldest average populations uh, in the world, actually. And so all of these sick individuals showed up at these in these hospitals at the very same time. And they were dealing with the same challenges we had, struggling with all the sickness from the seasonal flu. They completely overwhelmed their health system. Um, they had to call doctors from the south of the country up to work in the north. They called military doctors in to help with the hospitals. My colleagues over there talk about working 24 hours straight in the hospitals. And unfortunately, they were having to make life and death decisions 
because there's only so many ICU beds, there's only so many ventilators. So when you see on the news that the mortality rate in Italy was high, approaching six, seven percent, it's not because the virus is any worse over there, it's because so many sick people showed up at the health system all at the same time. In South Korea, they quickly practiced uh, either quarantines or social distancing was, is being advanced here. And they were able to broaden their curve, flatten the curve, and they were able to uh, just um, keep the, the hospital systems freed up so that they could care for the very sick. And their mortality rate has been substantially lower. Um, do we have an opportunity here to flatten this curve? Uh, what I want you to look at is the, the dotted line um, uh, across uh, here is showing the average daily increases, which is about 33% new cases every day. And what you can see is we're on the same path as Italy and Iran and Spain and Germany and France, just as, as you've been hearing on the news. So the opportunity here is, you can see where the U.S. is. We're lagging timeline uh, behind these other countries. But the question is, do we have an opportunity to flatten this curve, try to get our total number of cases uh, lower? I want to show you actually um, how this works. Here is showing what happens when you have everyone just going about their business, in red is someone who's infected. And so if we're all busyness going around the country, going to our workplaces, going to the stores, etc., you can see how quickly people get sick. You can see uh, that this very quickly could overwhelm a healthcare setting. So what are we talking about in flattening the curve? Well, what we're talking about is this one right here. If we get people to just sit tight, stay home, uh, stay out of the public forum, you can see there's less interactions and you can see that this dramatically flattens the curve. And in fact, what is actually possible is more people will actually be recovering from this illness, less likely to infect other people. And so not only do you have less sickness, but you also have the opportunity to even transmit that to other individuals. What people have been concerned about uh, is that in the early days of this illness, taking the lackadaisical approach, that we were very quickly going to overwhelm our health systems. What we're hoping is here, um, washing hands, um, working from home, events canceled. Um, you know, we can get all excited that we've done a great job, but let's remember, we could be in the long haul here. We don't want to just do this for a week or two and then say, oh, everything's great and we can go back to normal we risk actually having uh, another increase uh, at the latter end. So we've all got to prepare, be prepared to hunker down um, for, uh, for a long haul related to this. There's um, some echoes here from the flu pandemic of 1918. Um, the, the flu pandemic of 1918 was actually influenza. This is the regular seasonal flu that we see every year. But the reason this was so bad probably is multifactorial, but keep in mind we had just come through a world war where people were traveling all over the world with troops and invading armies and all sorts of things. Um, medical care was, uh, was decimated in many communities. This was particularly harsh for the younger people in the world, probably because about 40 years earlier, a very similar strain of the flu virus had already affected the older people. And so a lot of them had some cross immunity to this, um, to this flu epidemic in 1918. But look at the headlines over here. Um, ban on dances, uh, schools closed, no services in churches on Sundays. Um, this is what they were dealing with. And you can see by this picture, the health system were completely overwhelmed. This, uh, this affected 25% of people on the entire planet. I, I learned a very interesting anecdote from my own family history. Um, uh, just this past week. Um, now, just to, to set the scene here, my uh, maternal uh, grandmother's maiden name was Deeth, and it's spelled D-E-A-T-H, so it's a little bit funny. But my aunt shared this story. What she noted, my, my, uh, my great-grandparents were farmers. Uh, my grandma was telling her about the pandemic from 102 years ago. So my great-grandpa death, her grandpa, um, actually fell quite sick with this. Um, my grandma, uh, her mom was only four years old, and they were under quarantine. And so my grandma Deeth actually had to uh, leave uh, 
uh, my grandma in the house for hours on end. Grandpa was totally incapacitated in bed. She had to go to the barn. They had a dairy farm and she had to single-handedly get the water for the dairy herd, which was off property. She had to muck out the stall gutters. She had to feed and restraw all the milking stalls. And then she milked the herd twice a day by herself, clean, sterilized all the milking equipment, etc. And none of the neighbors were allowed to assist uh, my great grandma in any way. This was a lady who was about five feet nothing. Uh, I remember her just as a, a, a little bit of a thing. I can't imagine her doing this on her own. And that really leads us to um, what our opportunity here is as a church. Um, as you know, our th mission is to recognize everyone and communicate hope. Uh, everyone's been uh, set, you know, set in a bit of a spin here and we're having to adapt, but we don't want to lose sight of uh, what our mission here, recognize everyone and communicate hope. 